So how did you do today in your devotions with God? Remember, we've been teaching you that meeting with God first will completely straighten out your day. Amen. So if you don't put God first, now the reason why I'm saying this is God is the, his son, Jesus Christ, was the first fruits from among the dead, wasn't he? And, you know, the Jewish people celebrate the feast of first fruits. And the feast of first fruits and all of that is really basically telling us that God, the Father, honors his son and that when you and I put him first, he causes all grace to abound towards us. Can you say amen? Now, what the enemy does is he tries to get everything else to be in the way of our relationship with God but you're wise enough to recognize that and not let that happen. Say amen. All right, we've been telling and then talking about the truth about series. And this one here is very, very powerful because there's a tool that the enemy uses often enough that we need to pay attention and learn how he uses it and how to thwart or how to rebuke the term of that tool. And that tool that Satan uses against the children of God and people in general is offense. So this is the truth about offenses. Amen. So good morning, saints. Welcome to this briefing. What a great family you are. It's so nice. Amen. Our family is great. They love one another. They are purposed. Those of you coming in from California and Texas and New York and some of those other places, you're letting us know that somebody's sending you some of these teachings. And we do appreciate the fact that you're willing to watch and you can laugh a little bit with me, okay? So basically, let's get into this. Our Father wants us to be aware that we have an enemy and his job is to harass us to get us to be frustrated, to be stressed out. But you and I find our rest when we come to Jesus and we sit down and we rest at him. Come, say amen. All right, so remember the Cain and Abel syndrome. Everyone, say, I'll never forget Cain and Abel. Okay, I'll never forget Cain and Abel. So we're going to relate the Cain and Abel scenario to your flesh and spirit. We know the story in Genesis that Cain killed Abel because Cain wanted to do it his way and his deeds were evil. We found out that Satan went and camped in, in Cain's head and got him jealous, got him angry, got him really mad about his brother. And we find out that Cain out in the field killed his brother Abel. So how does that relate to our lesson today? Well, the devil is using the canes of life to attack the Abels. Let me clarify. We learned that our flesh is which one? Cain or Abel? Cain. Cain slew Abel. Okay. We learned that our spirit man... I'm sorry, that should have been informed to him. We learned that our spirit man is able. So, we are able, can you say amen? But our cane gets in the way. And so what we need to do is we find out that what the enemy uses, he uses offenses. Hello? He takes and gets people offended, and he tries to offend you. Everyone say, oh me. Okay, remember Cain and Abel, the devil feeds off of the fear, the anger, the jealousy, the, the being people one against another. He places these thoughts in our minds and sometimes they're unsuspecting thoughts. When a human turns on another human, this energizes the devil and gives him power over the situation. It charges up his batteries. <clears throat> so we now know why throughout our history of the world, there's wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, color of people, kingdom against kingdom, 
Hello? Sometimes husband against wife, God forbid. Sometimes brother against sister, Jacob and Esau, huh? Hello? And so offenses is something we need to be aware of, and we need to know how to combat Satan's tool of causing offense. Someone say amen. amen. Didn't Jesus say a house divided against itself cannot stand? Now, I know I'm sounding a little negative here. Don't worry, we're going to give you the cure here in a minute. But I want you to let you know this is probably one of the greatest tools Satan uses against Christians. Something offends you and so you go away. Now let me bring you back to, to Adam. When Adam and Eve had sinned and God came to fellowship with them, God said to Adam, what? Have you eaten of the tree? Why are you hiding? So Cain is a hider while Abel is a worshiper. Can you say amen? Your spirit wants to fellowship and be with God, yet your body wants to sleep in and do its own thing. Someone say, oh, me. So we want to make sure a house divided against itself. So if you are a person that doesn't deal with your flesh and doesn't pray first thing in the morning, you're going to have your flesh periodically rise up and give you problems. God forbid. So a house divided against yourself. What the enemy wants to do is to keep our house divided, keep you divided against yourself. Hello? Can we think of a scripture that says that a double-minded, uh, divided person cannot get anything from God? Yes. A double-minded man is unstable. And a lot of people don't understand what the double-mindedness means. It means switching from your old man to your new man. From your new man to your old man. Your old man to your new man. New man to your old man. So what do you do? You bring your old man to the cross in the feet of Jesus every morning and you say, crucify me. So Cain is gone. And Abel can continue to fellowship with God. Everyone say, my spirit man is the Abel of my life. And my spirit man allows me to be able to walk with God. Is that correct? All right. So now, folks, listen. Is of houses divided against itself. That's why Satan uses all kinds of offenses. That's why we are to walk in God's love. Amen? Why? Because God is love. So if we walk in God's love, we walk in love, then offenses, when they come, we will pay it no mind. Can you say amen? Besides, you were supposed to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, but not you personally, but Christ who lives in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh throughout the day is affected by God and his way and not by the suggestions of human beings, nor the news, nor this thing or that thing. Why? Because heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. You and I are people of the word. Look at somebody and smile and say, wordies, the breakfast of champions. I want to get Michael a t-shirt that says that. Word is a breakfast of champions. Why not? All right, so let's get into this. Go with me to Luke chapter 17. Again, this is very, very important that we understand this because this is how the enemy uses uh, this tool of offenses to cause people, churches to divide, cause people to get upset, uh, breaks up friendships, marriages by offense. Listen. If you value something such as your life, then any threat towards your life could offend you, right? But if you give your life to the Lord, your life is over and now God's life lives through you. When somebody attacks you, he says, hey, my dead man's not going to get upset. I'm sorry. You could yell at me, call me every name in the book, but guess what? Jesus is Lord of my life and I'm not going to take the offense. You're not going to take the offense. It might be given. It might be sent your way. It might come by letter. But you're not going to take it 
personally. You're not going to take it into your bosom. Jerry, you're a real jerk. I'm sorry. Take it up with the Lord. So it doesn't affect, you know, so it doesn't affect. Remember, saints wants to affect us because we're good people. We're filled with God. We're carriers of an infectious gospel. Hallelujah. So what better way to try to discourage us and frustrate us? So we had, we're going to take offenses as an enemy. But folks, not only do offense, offenses come, but sometimes we can cause them. So we're going to give you wisdom about that too. Can you say amen? Luke 17, then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, English says, it's impossible. People are going to offend you. Offenses are going to be there. Hello. Some of us get offended beyond the way our children are treated. Some, we get offended. Now, I'm ta not talking about it in a bad way, but it affects us. Can you say amen? So let me go on with this. So we can't stop offenses from being out there, folks. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, it's impossible for us to stop that. But woe to him through whom the offense comes. The one that's giving the offense don't be given offenses. Don't cause people to stumble. Can you say amen? Because there's a woe to it. That means, woo. Okay. And really emphasize there. Okay, let's go on. I sure love you. Good morning to you. All right, so look at this now. He says, it would be better for if a millstone were hung around that person's neck and that he were thrown into the sea that he should offend one of my little ones. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? So you don't have to defend yourself, folks. When somebody starts coming against you, you just go to God. A millstone is being picked out. Hello. <laughs> Pre millstones here. Who'd like their millstone? How big would you like it? Just cause more offenses and you'll have a big one. So let's move on past that. I think you can get a little humor out of that. But All right, so now, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. In other words, pay attention when you're walking with God. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Now, remember, this is under the Old Testament. So if somebody trespasses against you, he says, hey, I don't want you picking on me like that. It's okay to say that. Get your hands off of me. Hello, ladies. You got a big purse, fill it with a lead brick. And somebody gets too close to you, woo, woo. You'll be like David and Goliath. Can you say amen? Now, take heed to yourselves and that your brother sin against you, rebuke him. And then if he repents, forgive him. So in other words, don't set yourself up to be offended and carry that offense. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, of course, none of you have ever experienced anything like that. And the seven times in a day he returns to you and saying, I'm sorry, I repent. You shall forgive him. That's a heavy. But folks, remember, you are not operating on your ability. You're operating on God's ability in you. So the love you forgive others with is God's love. For he shed the love of God abroad, abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And God is love. So we love him, right? We love the person that gives us insults. We don't revile back. Say amen. That's, this is Jesus talking. Now, here's a couple of things I want to bring up. I have four points. Number one, you and I can't stop that people, offenses might come. Okay? And also, we can't stop them from coming, and we can't stop them from going, because sometimes we make mistakes and we do offend people. But we can ask God to help us to not cause offenses or let the offenses of someone else affect us. You can pray and ask that, and God will help you right on through it. Say amen. Two, never forget the Cain and Abel effect. It's always all through the Bible. Flesh is Cain, Abel is the spirit man. Which one is in control of your life at this moment? Abel, say amen. I said it for you. 
Amen. Be surprised. People can sit in a sermon and they can be mad at the pastor the whole time, not to get a thing out of it. And they'll leave and I'll say, Ah, well, bless God, another dead day, you know. Everybody else get, having a great time. You know, it depends on where we're at. Who's in charge, Cain, the flesh, or Abel, our spirit? And you're the one that makes that choice first thing in the morning. Don't go through half your day until something breaks, then you pray. Mm -mm. Wrong way to do it. Thirdly, we were created to be a blessing. Say, I'm a blessing. And we were created to pass out Jesus Christ to our, from our hearts to everyone. Blessing others. Can you say amen? amen? Well, Pastor Curry, what do you think's wrong with me? Well, brother, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, no. Let's get that taken care of. You see, when you're sharing the gospel, you don't have to smack somebody with them. Share, hey, your heart's broken. I can look in your eyes and there's an empty spot. Let's get something in there to fill you up. Would you like to meet God himself? How am I going to do that? Hey, you can pray with me. I have a sheet in the back. It says, Roaming Through Romans Road. It teaches you how to lead somebody to the Lord. It fits right in the leaflet of your Bible. I designed it hunt. A hundred years ago, lots of years ago. And it, you put it together and you just sit down with somebody and you go through it with them. And it leads them right on to the Lord. Amen. I call it the road of salvation. Can you say amen? And then fourthly, always forgive. Say this with me. I will always forgive. At times, even if I don't want to. Because you know, there are times that really you can get hurt. Be honest with yourself. Remember, God loves that honesty. Amen. Always forgive and release them of their debt. Father, forgive us our debts as we forget our, forgive our debtors. How much did our Heavenly Father forgive us? What do you think? All your sins, all the things you've ever done wrong. Some of you were, tried drugs. Some of you tried alcohol. Some of you just got messed up in life. Amen. And, and how much has God forgiven us? So you can see the travesty of somebody coming to you, maybe owes you something or caused a little offense on your behalf, and how that you would sit and, and not forgive them. If God forgave you all of that debt, all the things you could never repay, how dare we just turn on someone else and say, hey, I'm going to make you pay me the 20 bucks you owe me. And so the attitude of that... Do you see that? The attitude of that attitude is evil. It's the Cain attitude. It's the one that causes offenses. Amen. How many you know some people forget? Hello? Did you know that Christians, I mean, for heaven's sake, the Bible says forget, forgive, let go. And then when they see that person to get all those memories come up, you know, and then all of a sudden you start feeling that way again. Let me stop you. That's a trick. If you have said with your mouth, I forgive them. If you have said in your mouth, I release them. Whether it doesn't matter what your mind is saying. Amen. Remember, Satan puts your words in your mind that agree with his lies. So if you hear your voice throwing through your mind, says, I'll never forgive them. You know where that came from, and it wasn't you. Here's another little trick. When I first found out how important it is to have a good, good words and a good confession to say the right things, how many found out? And then you found yourself going around correcting everybody because their confession was bad. <laughs> Amen. I found out that you apply the truth in your own life, and you pray for everybody else that needs to understand it. But God doesn't want us to be double-minded, does he? Always forgive, release people. Why? Because if they have trespassed you and if they truly have a heart of being evil, God will take care of them. God doesn't want you troubled about what somebody does. Let me give you an illustration. How many has ever had somebody pull out in front of you in the car? They almost crashed you, irritated you to no end. They drive off don't even know you exist 
and yet your whole half day is irritated by that I'll pull it out in front of you. Now, how mature is that? I know one person that made a gesture, and the other person made a gesture back. Then the other person made another gesture, and another, we won't say what those gestures were, but that person followed them to a parking lot and began to wail on them. Hello? We don't want to cause offenses. Jesus says, now many will be offended because of me. He did say that in the gospel, and he says, how are you going to handle, because you have God in your heart, when you share God with somebody and they tell you where to go, where to stick it, where to shove it, are you going to let that offend you? Are you going to smile at them and say, hey, I was just like you. I ran away from God so fast, I hit him head on. <laughs> Amen. So when somebody starts to engage you and offense you, you know, and this kind of thing, smile and start laughing or whatever it takes to get you not to take that offense unto yourself. Say amen, somebody. Woohoo! I'm done preaching myself happy. My leg just got caught. So you, you see me doing this dance up here and all that kind of stuff. You know what's going on. You know, my, my fake leg is going one way while I want to go the other. All right, so Matthew, listen to what Matthew says. In Matthew chapter 6, Gives us the wisdom about forgiveness. Okay. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. So for if you forgive man their trespasses. Okay. Your heavenly father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men from their trespasses. Of their trespasses. Neither will your father forgive you of yours. Whoa. So can a Christian say, I will never forgive them? What if somebody really did hurt you, hurt you so bad? What do you do, Pastor Kerry? You give them to God. You ask God to give you the ability to let them go and release them. Hello? And you refuse to say anything bad about them. Amen. And let God do the healing. Say amen, somebody. Listen to what Matthew 18, 32 says, dealing with... Remember the story? It says that you have an offense to your brother and you go to him and he doesn't hear it. And then he says you take with you one more testimony and you go to him, two brothers trying to restore that, that other brother and he still wouldn't hear. Then it says take it before the entire church. Boy, that's a hard one to deal with. I've only had to do that about five times in my entire life. But I had to stand someone up and expose them right in the middle of the church. Hello. Why? Because they were causing staph infection. Do you know what staff infection is? It's when people go in and start gossiping in their church and all that kind of stuff, and they affect everybody's way in which they look at somebody. That's an offense, and God condemns it. And the Bible says if your sin is affecting the whole church, then you have to rebuke them openly. Thank God I pass on that. All right, so listen. Matthew 18, 32 says, So my heavenly Father, my heavenly Father will do to you if you, each one of you, from his heart does not forgive his brothers as trespass. And so what he said is, agree with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Lest he turn you over to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throws you into prison. I, and this is Jesus talking. He says, I guarantee you won't come out of that jail until you paid every little trespass you paid. Now everyone look up at me. Say Old Testament. Old Testament. There you got it. It's all Old Testament. But it still applies in our flesh. So if we from our heart won't release somebody, it could bring us under oppression and bondage. Hello? Amen. And the, not God anymore, but the devil will hold you into a bondage until you ask God to get you out. Yes. Now why hold anything against another person, even if they did do something? Why hold it against them? It's a trick of the enemy. Are we God? Of course, we don't want to be hurt again, but we have no right to hold anything against anyone knowing that God didn't hold anything against us when we asked Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to forgive us. Are you beginning to see a picture here? So offenses, Satan uses offenses. So our Heavenly Father 
will take care of you if you won't from your heart forgive. As we sow, so shall we reap. All right, next point. When a person gets offended, what happens? Proverbs chapter 18, please. This is how Satan works. This is what we need to know. And this is why we're not going to go around offending people. Can you say amen? As best as we can by the help of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 18, look at verse 19 through 21. It says, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And it can, contentions are like a bars of a castle. So a brother offended is hard to win to the Lord. They're like a contentions are like bars in a castle or in a jail. A man's stomach shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Notice that's all in one portion. So it's saying somebody that causes offenses doesn't know when to shut up and they'll be filled with their words offending others. Hello. It also works that way. Hello. Are you still talking about what your brother did, your sister did some time ago? Stop it. Give it to God and let God handle it and pan it all out for you. You get on and serve the Lord, win souls. Enjoy your life. Can you say amen? You don't need to be caught up. Here's one thing the enemy does a lot. He gets us caught up in the affairs of this life. He says, as a soldier, don't get caught up in the affairs of this life. So what happens is somebody's getting their feelings hurt. So you decided you're going to go into that family and you're going to straighten up all their messes. You're being caught up in the affairs of life and you don't want to do that. You get caught up with God tells you to get caught up and don't try to fix everybody. Say amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you need fixing. We all do. That's the fun of walking with Jesus. He's fixing us all day long. And he's doing it in a way where we won't always break the same way all the time. He's strengthening you daily as you walk with him. And some of the little habits that you don't like about yourself, he's working those things out. You just keep walking with them. Hello? Remember, Cain lives with you. You got up this morning, looked in the mirror, and there was Cain. Your flesh, that's what I'm referring to, okay? And you went, oh, holy cow, I better do something about that. All right, move right along, okay? Now, he says, a man's stomach will be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And if you're causing offenses, you're going to be filled with offense. For the produce of the lips, he shall be filled. Now, listen to this. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. So we really need to really watch it. We learned that the other couple of weeks ago. But anyway, a person that is offended... We call that a root of bitterness. Everyone say root of bitterness is offense. When somebody's offended and they don't deal with it with God, that root of bitterness will come out in their conversation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth slippeth, right? Are you with me? So whether you like it or not, that is going to come up. So you're talking about great things and all of a sudden somebody brings up something and nope, everybody's feeling a little weird about it. Because they've never let that go into the hands of God. They're bringing it up again. Had a guy come to me years and years and years ago. And he had a problem when he was younger. And we fixed his problem for him. I won't go into the detail. But he had an overemphasis of little children. Now, he wasn't a member of the church here. But he loved little boys. And so we had to deal with him in his mental capabilities with that. And so one day he comes to me, he says, why does everybody think bad of me, think poor of me, and think of everything? I says, well, we haven't seen you for four years, and the only one that brings it up is you. I never saw him again, because he never really dealt with that in his heart, and he loved talking about it, because it got people all arguing and all upset about stuff. Did you know there are some people that love the attention they get by not getting their lives together? They'll just be a mess because they get more attention from you for being a mess than they do from 
being better. Hello, oops. No, it's the truth. There are professional bummers that all their life, everything's a bummer. And if you make friends with them, if you don't get them changed, you'll be a bummer. A relationship become a bummer. Choose your friends, folks. The Bible says don't hang around those a bad reputation because then you'll be called like them. Guilty by association. Let's go on. So, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong-armed city. Contentions are like bars of a castle or a jail. A man's stomach shall be filled with that stuff. For the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Point one. People who get offended are hard to win to the Lord. Some people, when I was away from God, I never stopped loving God. But I was away from church for a while in my life. And I traveled with my mom. She had Lou Gehrig's disease and she was dying. And my dad was falling apart because his life partner was co coming unglued and all that. And, and the funny thing about it is, is that you have to, you just have to unplug everything. You just kind of have to let things go. And people get offended. They're hard to win. I ran into so many Christians. There were in bars, you know, I'm going to get to that in a minute. There were partying. One guy was a cocaine addict. And he talked about Jesus and snort cocaine. And I go, Lord, how does this all happen? He says, because there are offenses they've never dealt with in our heart. And somehow they've got a concept that everybody that goes to church is a hypocrite. So they stay away from it. And they got all these concepts. Hello? You know who's behind that? And you know what? During the time I got stoned with him and he got stoned with me, we both talked about Jesus the whole time. So I said sometime, what, why are you away from church and the people of God like I am? I know why I am. Why are you? And he says, I'm mad at them. They don't know how to accept their brethren. They're too busy biting and devouring one another, picking on each other's fault. I couldn't come back and get restored. And so how many thousands, possibly tens of thousands, of people no longer return to church because of offenses? Should we know how to deal with them? Amen? Sure we could. There's a great uh, speaker out. He, what is his name? He did one on offense. We got a, a video of it, the whole thing. And that's the tool the enemy uses. Get somebody offended and so they up and change the will of God. They go find another church and they just seem they could be in charge of their own life because of offense and we don't want people offended. Can you say amen? But Jesus said, because you love me, people will get offended of that. That's nothing you have to be worried about. John Revere. John Revere is his name. Okay. So people get offended. It's hard to win them to the Lord. Someone offended will be filled with that offense and out of the abundance of their heart their mouth speaks and causes more offenses these are the devil's tools now i'm going to get to the positive guys hang with me here okay hold on and then thirdly we are offended when we get when we lose or can't control our tongue we can bring offense can you say amen how many has ever caught yourself? You could say something, but you didn't. And it was good. How many know? Just because you can, should you? If it feels good, don't do it necessarily. Are you still with me? You see, some had offended... We will be filled with that offense and they will share offense. It's called a root of bitterness. I was on that earlier. That means that whatever comes out of your, your heart, you're going to hear bitterness and excuses and things like that. When that does happen, you know to pray for them and you know to love them. But don't get in a corrective mode where you're going to correct how they're talking. Because somebody that's all caught up in offense and think they're right about the offense and everything. When the moment you step in, it's going to like throw in salt and an open wound. They're going to punch you. Christians, stop speaking the obvious. 
boy, you look like a hundred pounds of sin to drag through a knothole backwards. Have a great day. Sometimes they blurt out things without thinking. Hello. So anyway, we don't want to cause offense. All right. We need to paint the right pictures with the words we say. Can you say amen? Go with me to James chapter 3. Verse 1 through 5, paint the right pictures with the words you say. Now, communication is wonderful, isn't it? If I need to say to you what I think and what the plans are about what we're going to do, I need to communicate that to you so you are on the same page with me. Can you say amen? And I don't know about you, but there are some people when they talk, you get, after they're done talking, they're more confused than you were when they stopped, started talking. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Jesus was a perfect example of that. Okay? So Lord, help us to be that way. So James says in verse 1, chapter 3, My brethren, let, let not many of you become teachers don't think you're going to run around teaching everybody. Why, Pastor Kerry? Knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. How many know by our words we're justified, by our words we're condemned? So a person that teaches by words such as myself, I'm under stronger obligation to do right. Somebody asked me a long time ago, so how do I know a minister is not just a phony? You'll know him by the fruit. You'll know him by the miracles and the anointing. When he speaks or she speaks, there's an anointing of God in it. Their life is together and they're open and honest about everything. Someone say amen. Because there are what we call fakes. People that know the words, they know the Bible, they know all these kind of things, but they're only in for it for their own self. Now, here's, here's the main thing. You might have somebody say to you one time, how do you know you're not going to a cult? How do you know this is not some kind of weird church? We preach the word. We have no membership. Because cults, you have to join something and you have to give up everything. Here, we just want you to come hear the word. Listen to me, because I'm going to get into this. If you got an addiction, come, sit, and hear the word anyway. Because it's a word that delivers us. Don't wait till you're all cleaned up and then come to church. That's a good way to lose everything. You got an alcohol problem? Instead of dealing with it and wondering if anybody's going to like you, you get to church, sit in the front pew and get that word in you. Now I'll ask you, Jesus never differentiated between people, didn't he? He ministered to the sinner and certain people. It didn't matter. Why do we think we can't come to church because we smoke pot? I got people that say, oh, I, I, I slip up once in a while. So fine, come to church and get the word. Now, I'm not condoning sin. But the church has got this stigma to it. You can't go to church. You got to dress right. You got to act right. You got to be right. And so most people just say, what's the use? Come to church. You need help? That's when we specially come to church. Because it's a hospital for the sinner. It's a hospital for you and I because we're not all fixed yet. That's why Jesus says don't judge or look at other people's faults. Why? Because you got enough of your own. You and I work on them together. When you're so busy walking with God and working on things together, God will fill you with such great things. You won't have time to look at the faults of others. Or cause offense. Are you with me? I done preach myself good. And happy. Now listen to this. So James further on goes on. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word. He is a mature man. Able to bridle or control. His whole cane. His fleshly body. Indeed we put bits in horses mouths. They're much bigger than us. And that they may obey us. And we turn their whole body. Now, folks, what you don't see in that, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But notice, we put bits in horses' mouths. 
if we let him, God will put a bit in your mouth and begin to guide your steps. Can you say amen? Because if you got a bit in your mouth, you're not going to blow it by saying something dumb. I'm joking with you. Because God wants to control. How many ever ridden horses? I love riding horses. Now, if I could get on one, it'd be great. But horses, you, you ride a horse, it has reins and, and a bit in the mouth, right? So when you're riding a horse, do you ride a horse with the reins pulled tight? No. And you're pulling on the horse's head like that, and the horse is just going back and forth? That's the way you don't want to run your life. Don't pull hard on the reins. Two, you don't ride with loose reins where you just let the reins fall down on the horse and so the horse will go back to the barn. Whatever the barn's been trained to do. <clears throat> no. You ride a horse with loose but in control reins so the horse feels your slight tug and moves that way. We need to have the bits of God's spirit in our mouth. Can you say amen? We need to be filled with the spirit so God could just guide your steps, order your life, and you'll go, whoa, I love it, Jesus, when you drive. I could see the scenery. I was talking to somebody a long time ago, and they had a husband who loved to drive. He would get in the car, and he would go to where they're going to end up. No stopping, no going to the bathroom, no doing anything. No, stop and smell the roses. Stop and enjoy what God is showing you. Don't be so busy and caught up in trying to do this and trying to do that that you lose your joy in the time. Then you're going to run around offending people because you're not happy yourself. Amen. So, paint the right pictures with God's words. Now listen. Look also to the ships, although they'll be so great. See, we have a horse that's big. Now we have ships that are huge. So large and are driven by fierce winds. Sounds like life today. They are turned by every very little rudder, by a very little rudder, wherewith the pilot desires. Even so the tongue is a very little rudder. <laughs> a little member which boasts great things. Folks, how you talk is how you walk. What do you mean? Well, that's just killing me. I'm going to die if I do, die if I don't. <laughs> I am so happy. I could just carry the weight of the world. We say words like that, and we're trying to explain to somebody, and it's never been so more dumb in anything, the more you think about it. So what do we do, Pastor Kerry? Even the tongue is a little member that can boast great things. Let me ask you, have you ever boasted in the Lord? God is good. He filled my heart. One time I, I went after a full gospel business fellowship in Lake Wilderness out there in Renton. And God guided me. And we're going to get to this, so I need to explain this. He guided me to a little bar restaurant. I said, God, I don't want to go into the Lee Hotel. I want you to go in there. I have something for you to do. God, what if people see me going in there? It's also a restaurant, you see. The same problem existed, and we'll get to it. Back in the days of Jesus, in the days of, of Paul, because many of the Christians were so strong in their walk, they wanted a good piece of meat. In order to get a good piece of meat, you had to go down to the local idolatry temple where they sacrificed the meats and stuff to the idols. And if you were truly a man or woman of God, that wouldn't bother you because whatever you pray over is blessed. As long as they don't do something filthy with it. And you can eat meat, but then there are some people that don't want to even touch that, so honor them. They don't want to touch that kind of thing. Well, then that's fine. But don't say, I can't because I'm more mature than you. No. You see, it isn't the outward part that should affect us. It's what's in our heart. And so you might. What would you do if you saw Linda and I, and we went to Applebee's, and they had no seats, so we had to sit up at the bar. Would you think that we were drinking? You see? And so many people today think Jesus drank wine. 
because he came into the temples and he shared the gospel with the people. And so they called him a wine bibber. Let me, you know, I, man, folks, you got to study the Bible. Jesus was a Nazarite. Can you say a Nazarite? Say Nazarite. That means he could not touch wine. He could not. He, it was just like cutting your hair when you're a Nazarite. Jesus, have you ever seen pictures of Jesus? He didn't have short hair. He had hair clear down to here. Okay? And it was well kept because he was a Nazarite, a Nazarene. And their covenant with God is lengthening of hair. Not touching anything unclean nor wine. Now, folks, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the word wine is an all-conclusive word. It means not only vinegar, grape juice, same word, booze. Okay? Now, when it says take a little wine for your stomach's sake, you think that's booze? Have you ever had ulcers and put some kind of alcohol thing in your tummy? It'll double you over and send you right to the ground. He's talking about grape juice and watered grape juice. So folks, studying the Bible is very important because that's how Satan gets to us through deceptive because we are ignorant about certain things. So the same with offenses. Let's go on. Even so, the tongue can boast great things. So how many here would like to change the direction of your life? You went to God and God says, talk differently now. Start talking with faith, talking with hope, talking as things that are not as though they are. Don't talk the obvious. If you have a dog biting your leg, you don't go, here, dog, here, dog. <laughs> I got a dog on my leg. I got a dog on me. You call the, go the dog catcher. <laughs> Hello. But that's what we do. We go around saying what is instead of what should be. We have a what should be God that lives in our heart. And we're on a journey. Can you say amen? Woe unto the world. My next point is woe unto the world because of offenses. Why do people get offended, folks? Pride, flesh. Good. Very good. You don't have to go any further than that. We usually can offend with words, can't we? But sometimes we can offend with actions too. We're not careful. People who speak wholesome words actually control where they're going to end up. The first wholesome words you spoke that were really, really good, you said, Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. You spoke the most powerful, wholesome words you could ever speak in your life. Those words created a change in your heart. Now, if that created a change in your heart to begin with, what will constant good, wholesome words do? Man, you can't even imagine how good that would be. That's why the enemy always tries to offend us. Try to get us to be offensive in our ability. Are you with me? We can become sweet in our talk. Or we can be thorny or prickly. Didn't Jesus say something like this? He says, do men gather fruit from thorn bushes? Do they gather figs among thistles? The answer is no. But yet you're a thistle and a thorn bush and you are a sweet water reservoir. Can you say amen? Inside, you're sweet. You got God. Outside, you can be a little thorny and thistly. How you doing, Pastor Kerry? Fine. Why are you asking? <laughs> Thistly, thorny. How about a preacher that does that? Come on in here. Shut up. Sit down. We're going to listen to the sermon. <laughs> I'm just making that up. It's kind of thorny and thistly, isn't it? You follow what I'm saying? And so, when we share, we need to be sweet and not cause offense as best as possible. Say amen, somebody. Woe to the world because of offenses. Matthew 18, 7 says, Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. But woe to the man that gives them to you. Don't take them. Say amen. Now go with me to Romans chapter 16. Let's look at something. 
Romans 16, verse 17 through 20. I sure love you guys. The word is good, isn't it? Boy, it can set us free. All right, Romans 16, verses 17 through 20. Now I urge you, brethren, note, now listen, note those who cause divisions and offenses. What are we to do? Well, let's say you have a prayer meeting and you're off somewhere else and you have a prayer meeting and somebody comes in, immediately starts gossiping, immediately starts talking bad about others, immediately starts promoting themselves. What are they doing? They're causing divisions. What is Satan's tool? Another tool? He causes divisions. Everything is great. You're at the grocery store. You're telling people they can tell you're a Christian. You're all wonderful and everything. And so one of those people say, hey, where do you go to church? And you say, well, I go to this church. And immediately, everything stops. You do. You see? You see how Satan's so crafty? And so he gets a baptism against the Catholics and gets the Lutherans against the Methodists. I'm just making this up, but that's how it works. He gets the pew person over here who spent all their life in that one little place in the pew, got their name on it, and then somebody like me sat in that spot. Their whole day is ruined. And we want revival to happen. Come on. You guys got to have a little humor here. Come on. I know what none, none of you fit that description. Can you say amen? All right. So let's look at this. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine or teaching which you have learned and avoid them. Avoid them. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Verse 19. For your obedience has come known to all. See, Paul is saying, hey, you guys, are, I've got a hold of it. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise. Now, listen. I want you to be wise in what is good. How many know it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? It isn't God threatening us or telling judgment's going to come to America. Folks, judgment's been here. Didn't you get judged when you accepted Jesus Christ? Weren't you acquitted and forgiven? Amen. Well, stop wanting everyone else to be judged when you're forgiven. You pray for everybody else to find forgiveness. Can you say amen? amen. Satan working against each other. Democrats against Republicans and this against that. Let's get on the news and the news is going to help us be carnal and we're all going to do that and we're all, as the church of God, going, what in the world's going on with our nation? The same thing God said for 2,000 years. He says the devil, in his day, he's going to be a deceiver. He's going to deceive many, lest you walk with me, saith the Lord. So it says this, I love it. Mark those. For those who are of such do not serve our Lord, they serve their own belly. For your obedience has come as a testimony before all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. And I want you to be wise when it comes to good and childlike when it comes to evil. Notice what it says? What does that mean? That means, have you ever looked a little bit, how many held a little baby? And he's cooing and dribbling and just so cute. And then if it, I'm going to use me so you won't think how terrible this is. Then I'm holding the baby and everything. Finally, I look into his eyes and say, you're sure ugly and wrinkly. Yeah. And you know what? I still love you. And the baby's just cooing and everything. This is how we're to be when people do evil your way or they try to give you offenses. You're to be like an innocent child. Pay no attention to it. Don't take it personally. Now, another thing, too, that happens is sometimes people have to correct you. Don't take it personally. They're there because they love you. And if I have to ever say something to you about you really need to do it this way, I'm not picking on you. I'm after your best entrance. Can you say amen? Well, we need to be after each other's best interests. 
not pick on one another. Can you say amen? A couple points underneath the scripture. The world will judge because of their offenses. So the Bible says in 16th chapter of John that judgment came into the world because they did not believe in my son. Judgment came on to those that are sinners and those of the devil because he's judged already. Look it up. Okay, and so it says right here that the world is being judged because of the offenses they did according to Jesus and the Israelites. So the world rejects Jesus, it rejects the Israelites. Look at all this anger that's going on. God will judge them because of the way they treat others. See, thank God it's not me. I'll walk in love. There we go. Okay, two, in the church community, that's us, only one church, folks. So the big church down the street that loves Jesus is all part of the same church. We're just little branches. Can you say amen? And it goes like this. It says, in the church community, we also must walk in love and not cause divisions or offenses. Can you say amen? But meeting with God first, walking with him in his love, will take, we will take on a humble demeanor and not become offensive. Hello. Thirdly, Pastor Kerry, how do I keep from being offended? Number one, we are to walk from our spirit man, or from our heart out, not our flesh. Die daily in the presence of God when you meet with him. Doesn't take very long. And when you meet with him, he crucifies the part of you that gets easily offended. He nullifies it and neutralizes it. And if you keep up a consistency, then he takes you and he keeps your eyes on him. And so you can walk with him in the spirit of life. So you won't become distracted nor offended. That's our God. So are you telling me, Pastor Kerry, I become a distracted or offended when my eyes are off the Lord? Exactly. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Hello. So guess what? We're in God, right? But everything that you found yourself weak to, you were enticed about. Satan's trying to entice us. Amen. New car, you could make money. New house. Everything the enemy puts before you has so many complications with it and never seems to work its way out. It's the same as the carrot before the donkey. Donkey wants that carrot so bad, he'll run anywhere trying to get it, but never will get it. Satan works the same way, dribbles things in front of you, and you think, well, that could be God, that could be God. You know what? You shouldn't pay any attention to that. God will get you what you need if you keep your eyes on him. But you're liable to miss it when, some, when God hands it to you. You'll walk off because you were distracted to go somewhere else. I know a lot of people go somewhere else and are not getting a thing. And I don't mean another church. I just mean just wander around their own ways. <clears throat> There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the waves of death. So let's do it God's way. Say amen. <laughs> All right. And thirdly, Pastor Curry, how do I keep from pain? Walk in the spirit, meet with God. Man, so I went to God some years ago and I said, God, I got to have a message that's pertinent for today. I'm missing something. I, I want to preach the whole truth. I want to preach it in a wholesome way. But I'm missing something to encourage your people so they keep having all these problems over and over again. And they'll go through something and then they'll have another problem. Over. What's the cure for it? And he says, I'm the cure, but they have to meet with me. I'm telling you, God was waiting for some of you this morning. And you got too busy. Don't get under condemnation by it. And don't try to make it up. Just start. Say Amen. Say, man, I mean, it's nothing more richer. I sit down because of my diet and because of, because of the sugar situation. I have to eat in the morning now. I didn't before I used to fast. Because if I don't eat, then I break into sweats and I'll feel ill. And then you'll lose all taste for food. 
When you're dehydrated and, and you let your sugars get down, you lose all desire to eat. And to drink water is a real struggle. You see how Satan got that one and one? And so I decided, hey, I was going to eat a little something and drink a glass and a half of water in the morning. So I drank a glass and a half of them, and I started eating breakfast with him. So I made a little point with God says, you and I are going to eat breakfast. Right, Terry? <laughs> we got plenty of visiting time later. Okay, so anyway. So if you're going through something like that, you got to seek God and say, God, what, what do I need to do? So he says, why don't you just cook your favorite breakfast and you and I will eat it together. So guess what my favorite breakfast is? So I could care less, Pastor Curry. What's that have to do? No, anyway, so God and I sit down and we enjoy life. Why would God sit down and have breakfast with you? He'd do it with you too if you asked him. Because he's God and that's what he does. We have not because we don't ask him to get involved like that. You say, well, how long did it take you to get something like that and begin to realize that God wanted to do all that? Years. And I'm trying to keep you from years and try to tell you, let's start. All right, let's go on. Now, paint the right pictures with the right words. Woe unto the world because of offenses, right? And then Galatians 2.16 tells us this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. This should be actually 2.20. But Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. Remember? It's been cleansed, it's been quieted, it's been rejuvenated. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.16 says, if you don't want to be offended, you don't want to take offense, this I say, walk in the Spirit. Because you are off your mind. You're not thinking about yourself when you walk with Jesus. You're thinking about him. You're thinking about how God could work through you. You're not even thinking about yourself. So if you're not thinking about yourself and somebody calls you a nasty name, it's not going to register. Besides, you know that when somebody does that, they're in big trouble. All you got to say is, you know, Jesus, you'll take care of that. I feel sorry for him. Hello? So the point I'm making is we need to be sensitive to others' walks. And also to where we're at in our walk so we don't get offense offend, or we don't pass out offense. So, and finishing with you, okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, please, verses 9 through 13. Being sensitive to others' walks. Now, how many know you can't be oversensitive? You can't walk on eggshells. You know that. I just. Well, basically, when you walk into a situation and you have a whole bunch of young Christians, don't say things that's going to question your walk. You know where you're at, but they don't know where you're at. So don't say things that create questions, but talk which creates faith and confidence and a united teamwork. Can you say amen? You don't look at a young Christian and say, you know what God had me to do the other day? I walked into a bar and led the bartender to the Lord. These young Christians are going, what? So the people back in the day of Jesus, when we read this, they were going to the temple because they wanted a good chunk of meat. How many here like a good steak on the plate while you ate? I do. Huh? And or I like a good prime rib or I like a good, um, what is it, um, a, a, I'm looking, a, a, well, that's a steak. We're talking about now, gosh, I got a mental thing. Talking about uh, pork, a pork loin. I love that. You have it stuffed and all that kind of stuff. We like that, right? But in order for somebody to enjoy a meal like that, they had to go into the temple and a lot of the Christians 
knew that the temple wasn't going to hurt him, that the meat wasn't going to hurt him. There was no bugly boo going to jump on him when they were going down there. They knew as they wanted, they went in, got it, and everything like that. would be just like a person sat down at Applebee's at the bar and ordered a hamburger. But the people who are in the flesh will look and say, what's that person doing in the bar? Uh-huh. You see, and that's the offenses Satan uses. First of all, how many's ever asked you something and you found yourself having to excuse yourself? Don't do that. Don't try to justify or excuse yourself about anything. Just be wise enough to know that if the only place you need to sit is at the bar, you know, I'd check it out and be sensitive to everybody else and see if, how many people there actually know you're a minister. Then you should question the fact whether you should do that or not. So I will either eat flesh nor drink wine or do anything where it causes anybody else to stumble. So let's say you smoke cigarettes. Don't be smoking around baby Christians. Now smoking is not, is not a terrible thing, but you, it's not good on your lungs. But you see what I'm saying? But the Christian that goes in and has the attitude, I don't care what anybody thinks, bless God, I'm just going to be me. You're going to offend everybody that there's, your job is to be sensitive. When I see you, and I haven't seen you for a while, my job isn't to say, where have you been? <laughs> Hello? You see, we speak the obvious. Just say, hey, it's wonderful to see you. You see, so we need to be sensitive to others' walks. Everyone take a breath and say, Lord, teach me. Okay. Now, we have some very gracious people here today, families, and you are wonderful people, believe me. But we all could use a little polishing. Can you say amen? So in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9, says, But beware lest somehow the liberty of being a Christian of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge of eating in the idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak or young be emboldened to eat those things that offered up? Well, if they can do it, I can do it too. If so-and-so is having a beer, I could do one. Maybe two, maybe three. You see? We don't want to stumble anybody. Can you say amen? Now, folks, I don't personally drink. I can't drink. I don't want to drink. I drank for years, okay? To me, it doesn't turn me on. Never liked the taste of it. Drinking is not cool. And for Christians, sometimes what they're looking for, and I'm on tape, so I don't mind saying this, they're looking for a little relaxing, a little bit of a buzz. And I'm not going to condemn anybody for that. Jesus never did. But if you've got a glass of wine sitting at your table and you've got a bunch of baby Christians coming into your house, you don't need to have that wine at that table even though it's your house. You understand? Because their souls are worth more than your house and your will. I want to hear everybody say amen. Some Christians, they can't go a meal or two without having a glass of wine. And again, no condemnation there. Okay? I understand hard work and all that. I'm not condoning it, but God's not going to judge you because you do that. Only if you stumble somebody by it. You catch me? If you stumble somebody by it, then you're trespassing and it's a different story. Say, everyone's, you got it? How many here know I'm not condoning you to go out and, and party hardy, okay? Yeah. Have you got the balance in what I'm telling you? So this is really Paul trying to help people because the Jews always hated the Gentiles and the Gentiles always hated the Jews. In the name of religion, they cursed the very name of them. We don't want that. We want to live for Jesus. And Jesus, you know what? The only ones that are offended are the ones that are going to hell. The ones that love their sin more than anything else. But Jesus went to everybody who asked him for help. Never turn one person down and usually heal them all. Okay. So, let's catch this. All right. 
says, for if anyone sees you have a knowledge of eating in the idol's temple and not conscious of him who is weak, we embolden them to do the same. And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brethren perish for whom they love Christ too? But when you thus sin against your brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother to stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. The emphasis, listen, I don't want to give up my steak, but if you're a vegetarian, I'm not going to have a, a, a hissy fit because I don't get my steak because you eat tofu. Hello? I'm going to sit down and eat tofu with you. I actually like it. You understand? And your need to do something is, is so... I mean, I know somebody. And we had guest bands in here. And somebody's their need to do something was so important. They offended all the band members. Listen, our job is not to offend. Our job is to win souls. Are you with me? So the good news... Everyone say, good news, good news. All right, so now, point one, brothers and sisters, some of the children of God are weak in their convictions and often become offended. So be sensitive to them. Okay, two, we must be careful not to sin against a brother or sister as to offend them in that way. So don't let what you allow in your personal life be a stumbling block to someone else. I remember when I was over Eastern Washington, I did a, a crusade over there in a place called Randall, over there uh, next to Ronald. Do you know where that's at? Anyway, they invited me to come over there, so I brought a little team, about four of us. We went over there, and it was a revival in a house, and we had places just packed. I didn't know any of these people, and so I just preached the word of how God is faithful and how he wants to take care of us. This lady had a big growth on her neck. It was a goiter. goiter? Yeah. And it's actually a deficiency problem that causes it. And I, while I'm preaching, right there, I'm preaching the word how God loves us. The goiter went <laughs> healed. We had more of a revival there. God wants to be glorified. He doesn't want to offend anybody, but he wants to go right down into that person who's desiring to have God in their heart, and he goes past their excuses and, oh, I still smoke, but I can't come to church. Yes, you can. Don't let the devil lie to you that way. You come to church, sit there, and you punish the devil by saying, I'm going to hear the word. Yeah. You see? Next thing you know, you hear things and things begin to come together. Next thing you know, you realize who's been lying to you and who's been telling you the truth the whole time. Amen? Amen. Two, we must be careful not to sin against our brother or sister. Three, don't do or practice something that stumbles others, especially when you are around them. Hello? Don't get in an argument with your wife in front of a whole house full of people. Amen. Of course, my wife and I never argue. We have what we call intense fellowship. Moving right along. Actually, it's not bad at all. Best woman I could ever be with. Sorry, ladies. I don't want to offend you, but that's the lady of there. All right. So now, thirdly, don't do practice anything that cause your brother to stumble. Fourthly, so if you do some things that you feel are okay... Be watchful you don't stumble another person with it. Don't show up at a vegetarian's house with a T-bone steak hanging out of your mouth and make them cook it for you. There are Christians that are just like that. They'll be rude to a waiter or a waitress, you know, and they... And then when the waiters come, wait, they're just working really hard. Listen, if you're ever tough on a waiter or a waiter, you tip twice as much. Hello? That's a hard job dealing with people, folks. You know, you had to deal with them too. And if you're in a service where you're dealing with them every day, 
Mm-hmm. Mm all right, so if you're with me, so if you do some things that you feel are all right, then that's fine. But don't sit there and wave something that you know somebody else doesn't agree with in front of their face and say, nah, 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 nah. Well, of course not. But Christians do it all the time. And you know what? God's keeping an account. So, 12 through 13 says, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather receive this understanding, not to put a stumbling block or an occasion of a, to fall in your brother's way. Hello. Folks, somebody tells you they love you, then the next week they're mad at you and won't talk to you. Don't let that offend you. That's just their instability. Take the higher road. And instead of looking down your nose at other people, look up, look up to them and pity some of the goofy things we do. Now, God told me that he had healing for somebody today. And it's in the area of your back and the length of your legs and hips. So I don't care who fits that des description. It could be a dozen of you. When a healing word of wisdom comes, the healing is there. You just receive it. Can you say amen? So think about it. Close your eyes for a minute. You got to weigh the fact whether or not you want to have somebody pray for you and put you on the spot. But I guarantee if you will let God and, and pray for you, you will be restored and you'll be able to walk better, not be so stiff in the morning when you get up. Amen. You're right up here. There should be two or three more. Amen. Okay. Now I, I need my partner from up there. We see her. Is it too hard for you to come on down there? You're not doing anything more now, are you? All right. So what makes us receive, Terry? How do we receive? By what? Open heart. By faith and an open heart, right? But also we have not because we... Ask not. So what I want you to do out of your own words, whether you feel worthy or not from your heart, I want you to ask God to fix the stiffness of whatever you want. Out of your own words, I'm going to agree with you. You just ask him. Great Heavenly Father, we praise you. Oh, you yes. We ask you, Lord, to do something with me. Take care of all this pain and things that trouble me from walking and standing straight and not falling. We give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. I want you to say this with me. I renounce. I renounce. Focusing on myself. Focusing on myself. And I pronounce Jesus as Lord. And Jesus is Jesus, Lord. come and take care of all of that. Oh, right there. Start thanking him, Terry. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, Lord, heal those muscles. Jesus. Those pain, uh, release them of Hallelujah. anything in Jesus' name. Any sin that might hold them in bondage. Anything, Lord God. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Woo. Just All right, get up. Don't, t don't grab for the crutch. Just get up slowly. Walk around. In Jesus' name. Start using that name of Jesus against any pain, against anything that tries to tell you you're not changed. You speak the word against it. Move around a little bit. Walk around. All right. Okay, where are the other two? I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. So you should have you should have had a no, you're not one, but I'll pray for you anyway, Seth. Amen. Amen. I can actually tell you who they are, but I'm not gonna do that. You gotta to learn to hear when God's got a gift for you. Come up and get it. You don't sit there. Or you can say, God, I'll receive it right where I am because I don't want to be on the spot. Okay, and that's good too. So, Father, thank you so much for this congregation. Thank you, Lord God, for those that desire to do more than offend, more than do anything else but to please you. Lord, bless them, strengthen them, keep them healthy. Help order their steps, Lord. Help them remind their relatives that God has open arms to them, is calling them to come. And Lord God, thank you so much that you have blessed us beyond measure. And we're so enthused about the plan of salvation you gave through Jesus Christ. And to get to know you better, Father, in Jesus' name. And all agreed said, Amen. Amen.